How many of you are in the energy business? You should all raise your hands. I'll bet all of you directly or indirectly are in the energy business. How many of you have energy as a significant cost of operations for your business? Yeah, I'll bet you do. All right, we're going to talk about the disruption of energy, because energy, which has been a fairly static industry for decades, is now an exponential industry with rapid, rapid changes in technology. Just so you know who I am, I've got a tech background, spent a long time at uh, this large company, I've run a tech start startup. I'm the author of five books, actually best known for science fiction novels, if you believe that, but it's a very exponential area as well. And a few years ago, I wrote this book about the challenges of natural resources and environment, and can we innovate fast enough to overcome them? And what I found in doing the research for this book, as somebody who loves technology, is that the technology progress in the energy space is incredibly rapid and far faster than most people take for granted, and that if we play out those trends and take the math seriously, it has staggering consequences. I'm also a clean tech investor, so I come at this from a perspective like your last speaker, looking at where are there good deals, where are there opportunities to disrupt markets and also build large new markets and large new companies, uh, and you'll see that inform this. So we're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about wind technology, we're going to talk about solar technology, which is incredibly exciting. We're going to talk about batteries, which are maybe even more exciting than solar. We're going to talk about what happens to oil because that's a big deal for markets in general. And finally, we're going to talk about how to take action in this sector. Okay, so wind power. Wind power uh, might look like a stagnant uh, 19th century technology, but it's actually one that has changed tremendously. Over the last dozen years, the amount of wind power we have deployed grew by 1,000% by 10x. That's not normal in the energy field. And that happened for a number of reasons. Policy pushing it was a big one, but that policy would not have been effective if it were not for an exponential decline in the cost of wind power. Whole power electricity prices in the US are around 7 cents, let's say. In the 1980s, which is the beginning of this graph, wind power cost nearly 10 times that much per kilowatt hour. Now, last year, the average price of a new wind power long-term contract in the US was actually 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour, and the cheapest were below 2 cents. That is a staggering drop in the price of wind energy, and it's been driven by a huge amount of innovation in the sector. A basic thing is that we have learned to make these wind turbines bigger. Why does that matter? Well, higher up, the wind blows more steadily and it blows faster. So that gives you an advantage. And secondly, the amount of power you get from a wind turbine is equal to the area the blade sweeps through. So if you can double the blade length, you can quadruple the amount of power you're capturing. You can also capture lower speed winds. So as we're learning more and more about manufacturing techniques, about new materials, we're able to tap into these. And you can see how the price of wind power in orange has plunged here as the scale of these turbines has grown. And as I said, this leads not just to Fast, more power at a lower cost, it leads to steadier power. Today, the wind fleet operates at a 30% capacity factor. That's the line on the left here. That means that a wind turbine produces about 30% of the max that it's actually rated for. But as we get towards taller and taller turbines, the Department of Energy expects that within a few years, we'll be able to get 60% uptime of these wind turbines. And now it no longer looks like an intermittent a platform for energy, but more like a steady one. And I will say that one of our sponsors here, GE, is one of the leaders worldwide in the development of these new wind turbines and innovating in new ways like the GE space frame to build them taller while transport them. You've heard a lot about big data, about machine learning and so on. Well, that is also vital here. Because these individual turbines are intermittent, what we found is that in cases like Colorado with the Excel utility there, using sensors on the wind turbines, collecting that data and putting it into algorithms to do predictions of which turbine was going to spin at which speed a few minutes from now, a few hours from now, and a day from now, allowed Excel to triple the amount of wind power they could put on their grid. And that saved them billions of dollars because this was the cheapest power they could buy in their state. Now, I told you that higher up, the wind blows more steadily. So Mark Andreessen says software is eating the world. This is an example of that. This is a, a prototype. It's not uh, in production yet. But this is a blimp from Altios that has inside of it a small wind turbine. 
But what it actually is, it's a drone. It flies under computer power, and it can hover about 500 meters above the ground, taller, three times taller than the tallest wind turbines, and tap into those high-speed winds, and then drop down in the case where uh, the wind is too high for it to be safe. Or this is another drone. This is a comp company called Makani Power in the Bay Area. This thing tilts back, takes off under computer control, flies up to as high as a kilometer up, taps into those high-speed, steady winds. You could never pay the capital cost for a kilometer-tall tower, but you can pay the software cost to self-steer this drone, and then it acts as a giant wind turbine in the sky. This company, acquired by Google two years ago, who wants to bring it to production. Now, there's a whole lot more I could say about wind power, but what I will say is that it's going to drop in cost, it's going to keep dropping in cost, but it actually pales in comparison to the incredible pace of innovation in solar. Solar panels are made like this. What's this? It's a chip. This is a silicon wafer made for chips. And if we wanted to plaster uh, thousands of square miles with uh, Intel chips, the cost for that would be quadrillions of dollars. It would be impossible. Right? But like silicon wafers, Solar power has had a ferocious cost decline, a ferocious and exponential cost decline. Over the course of roughly my lifetime, the cost of a watt of solar power has plunged by an incredible 200 times. That doesn't happen in physical infra infrastructure. It doesn't happen in tra tractors, it doesn't happen in trucks, it doesn't happen in cars. It happens in digital technology and in this one energy technology. And that means we're now seeing crossover, meaning that we now see solar winning deals without subsidies in various parts of the world. Of course, that varies by geography, by where you have the sun. In the US, it's in the southwest. Though we can transmit solar power as long as 1,000 miles or more with a few percent losses. In worldwide, it happens uh, especially in places where the 1.3 billion people that don't have electricity today live, and about three quarters of the world's growth in energy consumption over the next few decades will be in that square, which is a relatively sunny area, sunnier than Europe, for instance, that really led the development of solar. Now, I told you crossover is happening. Trends are nice. Let's talk actual physical cases. This is a natural gas plant in the US. The EIA estimates this costs seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour if you build a new one. Okay, so what's happening in solar? In Chile, we've had about a dozen deals won for solar won this deal at an average price of about six cents per kilowatt hour without subsidies. China, the Gobi Desert, also about six cents. India, the Sambar Ultra plant, four gigawatt plant, an enormous plant the size of four large coal-powered plants in capacity at 4.3 rupees per kilowatt hour, about six cents per kilowatt hour. In the US, this is a subsidized price. Two years ago, First Solar won this bid at 5.7 cents. Uh, last year, Nextera won a new bid at 4.2 cents. I have to keep updating this slide. And then about six months ago, First Solar sold to Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's firm, a 3.9 cent per kilowatt hour deal. And then last month, the city of Palo Alto bought solar from a company in LA at 3.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, this is a subsidized price, but back out all the subsidies, it's about five cents per kilowatt hour, still about a third lower than the price of new natural gas, and it's producing at peak demand time. Right? And around the world, it's even better than that. Mexico, the average price in their solar auction last month was 5.1 cents. The lowest price was 3.5 cents unsubsidized. And then these guys, well, this is the price in the US. You see in the last eight years, it's plunged by about 80%. Just a phenomenal pace of change. If you have an impression of solar or wind formed a decade ago, the world has changed enormously in that time. And that's what the new numbers are, those points at the, at the far right there. Or this is my favorite. In Dubai, one of the oil capitals of the world, this 800 megawatt plant, giant plant, being built. Uh, Aqua Power, a Saudi firm, is one of the groups behind this. And the price bid with no subsidies for this plant, for the next tranche, was 2.99 cents a kilowatt hour, half the price of natural gas or coal. 
So in the last three years, we've gone from solar being completely uncompetitive to solar in sunny parts of the world crushing all other competitors as far as price goes. And that has helped drive an enormous explosion. I told you that wind power scaled by 1,000%, 10x in a dozen years. Solar has left that in the dust 100 times growth in 13 years. Now, it's starting from a lower base, but that growth rate has been phenomenal. And if we put a trend on a log scale, which this is, is an exponential scale, and we see a straight line, that's an exponential. This is about a 40% cumulative annual growth rate over the last 20 years happening in solar. It will eventually slow down, it must. But for now, this explosion is unlike anything that we've seen in energy. Now, this happens for a lot of reasons. Manufacturing scale, one of the first exponentials we ever saw, actually, going back to the Model T, is you make more of something. This is cumulative volume of production on the horizontal axis, and the price drops on a log axis. This is the learning curve. And you can plot this on the Model T. You can plot this on a Boeing aircraft. You can plot this on wiring and buildings. Here it's plotted on solar. And this learning curve is quite ferocious. It's about a 20 to 25% reduction in cost per doubling of scale. And that's going to keep on going, keep on going for quite some time to come. And that allows the industry to reinvest revenue in R&D to make more and more efficient cells that capture more of the sunlight that hits them. So the prices are going to keep dropping. We are very far from done yet. And the prices that you see in Dubai or Mexico will one day be the prices in California. And then after that, they'll be the prices in middle America. And we have the ability to extend the grid to stretch it out. But what do you do if the sun isn't shining or if the wind isn't blowing, right? These are still intermittent resources, no matter how high their capacity factors are. There's a lot you can do. The top is one solar power plant in California. The bottom is 20 locations within about 100 miles. And you see how a cloud comes in and knocks out the power output from one. But with some grid integration, you have a far steadier output. You can also put solar and wind together. Here you see in Southern California, the sunlight is the, the orange segment here. And it peaks during the middle of the day, of course. And wind power, though, peaks at night. So it compensates, and this approximates the load on the grid. We think now that about 80% of electricity needs can be met with no storage, just putting together solar and wind and large-scale grid connections. Or here is in Germany, this is over a year. The sun shines in the summer, the wind blows in the winter. So again, put them together, you can meet something like 80% of the energy needs by compensating them against them. But there's another kind of challenge that happens, because solar is getting so cheap so fast, for a long time, the power prices that you all pay have been highest in the middle of the day, because that's when peak demand is, supply and demand. There's more demand in the middle of the day in the late afternoon, so prices are higher. But as solar comes online, we're perhaps a decade away from a point where the middle of the day power prices in much of America are actually the lowest prices because there's a surplus of power right then and there. So what do you do? Well, a lot of it comes down to flexibility. You've heard a lot about the Internet of Things. You hear a lot about smart power. Well, that's what this means, is being clever about how and when to use energy to match the prices. You all know this company, Nest? Who bought them? How much? $3.3 billion. Now, why does Google want a thermostat? Because this is part of the smart grid. This thermostat knows if someone is home, and it has a connection to the utility. And if the utility sees that a very expensive peak of power demand is coming late that afternoon because it's a hot day in Austin, then they can reach out to these nests and say, hey, we want to avoid that peak. Run the air conditioner a little harder a couple hours early, and then we won't have to have such a high peak demand and spin up new power plants. And the 
a person at home basically never notices this is happening, and they get a reward, they get a kickback from the utility because this is a savings of tens of billions of dollars potentially across the country. In Europe, it's hot water heaters, so these hot water heaters increasingly are smart. They know when the power cost is low. In Europe, it's when wind power peaks. Sometimes at night, the price drops to zero or negative. Utilities will pay you to take energy. And so these connected smart water heaters know that and say, we'll take that. We'll save it up for the morning. Or data centers. The world's data centers use now about 12% of electricity and growing. All that IoT stuff and cloud stuff, it's not for free. It's real. And it exists in places like this. And increasingly, they are becoming smart and able to absorb load. Or electric vehicles. We'll talk about those more in a bit. But as they rise in scale, well, wind power peaks at night. Your electric vehicle charger can know that. And if you have a Tesla, you already know that it has programming to go for low power prices. Or during the day, they sit at work. And whether it's solar panels at the workplace or just the solar utility scale connected to the grid, when that price drops during the peak hours of the day, that car is sitting there and ready to be charged and provide services to the grid by being able to soak up the extra. Water. I live on the West Coast. California's had massive drought. We can desalinate. Desalination is expensive, but about half the cost is energy cost. So this is something you can do when the energy gets cheapest. In fact, this is a desalination plant in Dubai. This plant consumes 12 gigawatts of power, and it desalinates about 500 million barrels of water, gallons of water, per day. It's an enormous scale. So mapping that to the lowest energy prices suddenly allows you flexibility you didn't have. Ultimately, though, you need energy storage. We all know who this is. Tony Stark. Oh, did I give away a secret identity? Sorry, sorry, Elon. Uh, so he's announcing the Tesla Powerwall battery. And the funny thing is Panasonic makes that battery and it's just got a Tesla casing on the outside. But it's not some technical breakthrough that got them there. It's a long-term exponential trend, a tripling the amount of power you can store per gram and a 10x reduction in the cost of batteries over the course of the last 20 years, and that keeps on going. In Germany now, it looks like with a small battery, about half the size of the power wall and a small solar panel, a German household can provide about 70% of its own energy in summer months. So if you're a utility and your business model is charging by volume, what happens to you in this world? Well, the business model is going to have to change, and now we see utilities wanting to own that solar panel so they can get it on both sides, and the ones that flourish will do that. But Tesla got a billion dollars in pre-orders the first week they announced the battery. Most of them did not go to homes. 90% were for this size battery, which went to businesses, commercial spaces, factories, and utilities. And now every manufacturer in the world that does solar is moving into the same thing. This is the Trina solar uh, battery, the largest solar company in the world. It's about a one megawatt hour battery. I've been inside of it. And they go after some very, very simple scenarios. Even if you don't care about solar, it's probably the case that you pay one price for energy at night, that's very, very cheap, and another price during the day. In California, that delta is about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, is the retail cost difference. Well, guess what? A battery is cheaper than that now. So you can fill it up at night with cheap power and then discharge it during the day instead of using that expensive power. And every battery startup I know, and I'm invested in a few of them, has this as their starter business model to get into the field and bootstrap themselves up. Battery prices are not done coming down. This is a whole bunch of different forecasts of where battery prices would go. And these analysts, including the EIA, that's the most conservative, saw you know, huge drops, 3x drop over five years, over 10 years when they made these forecasts. Well, Tesla today is right about there, actually. Uh, this is where Tesla said they would be three years ago, and they're there. They just announced on their investor call they're below $190 per kilowatt hour. So I believe in Elon Musk more than I believe in the Energy Information Agency as far as projections of the future. Batteries also follow this exponential learning curve. As they get higher scale, they drop 
in price. And they do so at basically the exact same pace as solar. So think of batteries as where solar was 15 years ago. Still high priced, but about to start their exponential plunge. And there's many, many more battery technologies we could talk about. So this leads to a crazy idea. And the idea being that energy going clean might actually be cheaper than dirty energy. Right? We've always assumed that going clean meant higher prices, but now we're starting to see even very conservative organizations say that it might actually be cheaper. This is the International Energy Agency, the IEA. This is not an exponential organization. Right? Let me show you that. Here's their solar forecasts over the last uh, decade or so, since 2002. So in 2002, that very bottom line, that was their solar forecast. 2004, they said, oops, it went a little bit faster. We lifted it. 2006, they, they lifted again, you know, ad nauseum. And the actual forecast, the actual growth has been the dark blue line. Now, who thinks they've got it right with that last line? This is the IEA. This is the world's experts. Have some faith, people. Who thinks they've got it right? You know, you're all smarter than that. You can tell who's the butt of my joke. Because this is how it maps, and the blue line is already lifted uh, substantially off of their last forecast from 2014. But the IEA says solar will be the dominant form of electricity by mid-century, and the cost will be unbeatable. Or UBS, you all know UBS. They said something that I thought I would only ever hear myself say. Renewables are now deflationary to energy prices. Right. We've coupled the cost of energy to the ever-declining cost of technology. And this is what we see in Europe, the ISC projecting this, or one of my favorite of these graphs, Alliance Bernstein, a private equity firm. They drew this graph. Across the bottom, you see the cost of coal, natural gas, oil. And on the top right there, I think somebody's kid scrawled with a crayon. Right? Is that what happened? No. This is the long-term view. That is a disruptive technology. Right? It's like you're Kodak and you think these digital cameras will never catch up. I've got the ultimate business model. I sell you the razor, I sell you the blades, and then suddenly I'm bankrupt and out of business. So the world is now deploying more clean energy per year than dirty energy, and we will never look back. I'm over, but I want to talk just briefly about what happens to oil. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is the former Saudi oil minister. The Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stone, and the oil age will end long before we run out of oil. He's warning his fellow princes that the world is going to produce a technology replacement for oil. And we are. Oil fluctuates. It's about a 2%, 2 million barrels per day. Difference in supply demand has caused this huge oil fluctuation. Nobody predicted it. Okay? But we are headed there, and EVs, I didn't believe in them three years ago, are going to get us there. Only one in 1,000 vehicles on the road is an electric vehicle, just one million vehicles out of one billion. It's a trivial number. Couldn't possibly be disruptive. They've got a 60% growth rate, though. All right. You all know this. Tesla announced this car, Model 3, 35K, 200-mile range. How many orders for this did they get in the first day? 300,000 was the final number in the first day. The EIA forecasted that we'd be selling 1,000 vehicles a year with a 200-mile range by 2040. All right, this is like, you just can't trust the experts in this. Trust the technology and the innovators, not the experts. And as the battery prices come down, we'll sell more EVs, which will bring down the cost of batteries, which will make EVs cheaper, and we'll sell more EVs. And it's a perfect virtuous cycle. And there's every reason to believe that EVs will ultimately be cheaper than internal combustion cars because they're far simpler. They have 90% fewer moving parts. This is the drivetrain and engine of an electric vehicle. And so if you take the learning curve, the rate at which they're improving, and you play out the cost of electric vehicles, you get that they will be not just cheaper than comparable vehicles, but by the end of, by 2030, they'll be cheaper than the cheapest car sold in the US, a two-seater smart car. That's a disruption. And at that point, you'll, they will be taking more oil demand off the market than caused the recent plunge in prices. So I don't know what the short-term price of oil is, but the long-term price of oil is very, very cheap as our demand drops. I am going to stop right there. I've given you a whole lot. Uh, so thank you very much. You can tweet at me or come find me afterwards. <laughs>